Here's the final version of Pong. You can move the paddles using the keyboard and it will keep score for you. Step one of writing the code for your game is to set up the scene. It started with the size of 700 and 700 pixels. The background color is black. I drew a red ellipse in the center and then I made one of my paddles blue and my other paddle green. In stage two of my Pong code, I'm going to add movement to my paddles. So let's compare some of the changes that I've made in the code. In the initial one, the two rectangles have a Y value of 350, which is right around the center of your screen. So you can see Y value of 350 and 350 right there. But they're static, they can't move. Over here, I want that value, that Y value to be able to change. So because I want the Y value to be able to change, I made them into variables instead. I have L rect Y for my left rectangle and R rect Y. So down here, uh, instead of it saying 350, I put L rect Y as the variable and then R rect Y for the right paddle. Down here is the code for the keyboard interactivity. So when the key W is pressed on the keyboard, the left paddle will move up because the Y value is decreasing, and when you press the key S, it will move back down. Then for the right paddle, I use the key I for up and K for down. You could honestly use any keyboard key that you wish. I happen to pick these because they were easy to access. So if you have two players playing, then one could take the W and S on one side of the keyboard, and the other player could take I and K on the other side of the keyboard. In addition, you could change the values here. So this is uh, how many pixels it'll change each time. I just chose six, but if you made it something bigger, like let's say 20, then it would just make it go a lot faster. So now when you go up, it will go a lot faster than when it goes down. In the original code, I only had the background in void setup, while in the new code, I have it in the setup and also in the void draw. You might wonder why that is. It's because if you don't put it in the vo void draw, then when you start moving your shapes around, they will actually leave the shadow of where they previously were, so it doesn't refresh. But if you add in the background, then it pretty much redraws these shapes every single time that it goes through the void draw, and so it'll give you a nice clean movement. In the third stage, I added movements to the ball, and I also added constraints so that the red ball would stay within the frame. So how did I do that? I had to add a bunch of variables. Uh, first, I made the ellipse X and the ellipse Y start off in the center of your screen, I could have uh, made that 350 by 350, but I decided to use width divided by 2 and height divided by 2, so that way if you ever decide to change the screen size, the ellipse will still show up in the center no matter what. I also created a move right and a move down. Um, that's a boolean, so it's either true or false. We'll get to that in a little bit. And I also uh, made the speed variable. So the reason I did that is because I thought that it was um, too predictable if the speed of the ball was always the same, so I wanted it, it to be something that could change later. Uh, right now, the speed for the extraction is 3 and the speed for vertical is 4, but we'll change that later. So down here, uh, we've already done the key press for the paddles, if you remember those move. So there's the paddles. And then down here is the section for the ellipse. So here we have the if condition, if move right is true, then the circle can move in the right direction, and that means its x value is going to change by whatever your speed variable is. So notice up here in the section for ellipse, um, it's now ellipse, or lx and ly, which are the variables, rather than an actual value, and so that value can change. And then the initial value is the center, but it will increase um, as soon as move, move right is true. 
and the initial um, condition for move right is true. If move right is not true, then uh, you subtract from the x value, so then it actually moves left. And then move down is the exact same thing, pretty much. If move down is true, the y value increases for the lips. And if the move down is not true, then it will move up. And then down here are the constraints. So because the screen side is, is 700 by 700, um, I had when the y value is less than 10, so like pretty much up here, uh, move down will be true because you want it to move down as opposed to up. And then if uh, it's greater than 690, which is around down here, then you change move down to false so that it doesn't move down. Instead, it'll move up. And then the same thing with x value. When x is less than 10, which is over here, uh, you make it move right. And then when the x is around 690, you make it move left. In this next section, I've added some fonts for keeping score. So you can see I put a title for Pong, and then I put in the score so that it keeps record. So how do you do that? First, you have to create a variable for keeping score. So I used count R and count L, uh, initial value 0, since nobody has a score in the beginning. Then you have to add a font. So the command is right here. It's P font. You also have to load the font and you have to give the name of the file for the font that you're using. So how do you find the name for this font? You go up to Tools, Create Font, and there's a whole list of them. So there's a bunch you can choose from, just scroll down. I happen to like uh, Arial, so I picked Arial Bold. And once you're satisfied, you can actually change the size too here to a different value if you wish. But click OK. When you click OK, what will happen is within your little folder where your um, processing file is, you'll create a new folder called data, and that is where the font is saved. So you can actually save multiple fonts if you wish. I just happen to pick one, the Arial, and you put the exact name of that font right here next to load font. Then down in the draw portion, um, you have to first introduce the font, so that's text font, and then you use the command text. So I wrote in Pong, and then this is just the XY coordinates of where the word Pong will appear. So I'll bring that up again. Pong is right around there at the top. And then I have two other text, uh, the text for the left count, and then the text for the right count. Notice I also, um, I put those right underneath the paddles that I drew because I wanted them to be the same color as the paddles. If I had put the text earlier, uh, they would have been red like my word Pong, which is fine, I guess, but I kind of like having them color coded that way. And then finally, um, how does the value for uh, the count change? So remember here, count is a variable, so it can change. And the way it changes, is when the paddles interact with the circle. So previously we did have the ellipse moving around, but now we want to establish that when the ellipse hits the rectangles, then that means the paddle has hit and you're going to score. So here's the original code just for moving the paddles. And now we have to add this extra section. So if the ellipse uh, moves outside of a, the left or the right border, that's when the count changes. So when the x value is greater than the 690 and you didn't hit it with the paddle, that means it went off of that border. So that means the left side gets a point. So that's count L plus plus. It'll increase the score value by one. And I've reestablished the ellipse in the center. On the other hand, if the x value is less than 10, that means it's gone off on the left side and then the right side will score. And then down here, is the portion which uh, creates that the paddle hit and then um, that it'll bounce back. So this one's a little confusing. Uh, I had to figure out where the ellipse was and where the paddle was and make sure that when the ellipse's x or y value matched with the rectangle's x or y value, that means that they're, they're touching and it has to bounce. So I had to change the direction. 
So there's one for bouncing off of the right, and therefore it'll start moving left. And then there's another one for bouncing off of the left one and starting to move right. So now you can see that in addition to the lips moving around and changing the score, I can also start moving around my paddles and interact with that ellipse. So at this point, your Pong game is pretty much functional, but the last thing I wanted to change is I wanted the ellipse to bounce around at a different speed so that it wasn't quite so predictable. And the way I did that is each time it hits one of the constraints, so either it scores or it hits a paddle, I change the, the speed to a random value between 3 and 6. So previously we had set the speed side and the speed vertical as either like a 3 or a 4. Um, and now I'm just setting it as a random value between 3 and 6, so it can be a little bit slower, a little bit faster. It also changes the angle that the ellipse will bounce around at. So anytime it bounces, I added this uh, random value right there, also when it hits the paddles. So if you take a look at it, it just makes it a little bit more exciting if there's a random change in speed. So one thing that happened is notice that like the count is an integer and the rectangle is an integer, but because I made the speed a random value between three and six right here, a random value between three and six, um, what that means is I had to change that from an integer to a float. So this is a float. And because I also was adding it to the ellipses X and Y value, it means that the ellipse X and Y value also have to be changed into float. If you try to keep it as an integer and then you try to add a float to it, it gives you an error message, so it didn't like that. Um, so just make sure these two have to be the same kind of variable. And that's it. Now you are done with your Pong game. Enjoy.